Have you ever wondered how much information someone could find out from you on the computer? Um, have you ever thought to yourself that you could have lots of personal information available on the internet, however you're just not significant enough a person for anyone to bother to keep track? <laughs> What if they did? First thing I decided to do to get started on this project was to go online, do a little research. Um, didn't take me very long to find out that I average about 24 shared acquaintances per each person that I know. I found my subject almost instantaneously, reason being um, he has an impressive over 50 friends in common. Well. That's it. I'm definitely going to have access to his friends. I know what you're thinking. Why am I interviewing people if I'm trying to see how much information I can get off the internet? Well, if you've ever used any of these social networking applications or websites, the first thing you know, they're all about online interaction between messages, comments, bulletins, notes, blogs, emails, and the fact that everybody can view everyone else's correspondence, you quickly learn that communication, gossip, and interpretation have as much to do with online correspondence as they do with traditional old school human interaction. Check out his Facebook. Um, his name is Nicholas Fisher. My first impression of this guy is that he's extroverted and not very shy because, for starters, his profile information was public. Sexual orientation, he's straight. Religious beliefs, he is atheist. Found out his phone number. He was born March 22nd, 1988. He's currently going to community college, finishing up his general education soon. Keep in mind, this is all information I found out in about five minutes. After getting Nick's email address off of Facebook, I googled it, found a forwarded link to his blog entitled, When I Cannot Sleep. He claims to be an insomniac, though I don't think that's true. I think that has to do with a chemical disorder. I don't think Nick has any chemical disorders. I think he just... Um, maybe he just can't, maybe he's not at peace with himself. February 2nd, 2009, blog entry, current contemplation. I feel out of place as an atheist, especially since I was the one to bring religion to this household ten years ago. Alone with my thoughts, that's all I can remember feeling for the past few weeks. If I could only describe what I've been thinking, horrible feelings of guilt and shame that I've been trying for so many years to suppress, yet these are the things that have fought tooth and nail to claw their way to the surface of my consciousness. I've also never slept in a room with as many mirrors as there are in my current abode. I don't like that I'm the only one to fill them. A nice vocabulary, a well-developed vocabulary. 
from reading. He's a kind of a gentleman like that, a gentleman of the arts. He liked to read a lot. I don't know a lot of guys who can read a lot, but he can read a lot. He can dedicate... He, when I met him, he was reading the sagas of the Icelanders, and I think he finished the whole book. That book is like a thousand five hundred pages. He's a really, really good spoken word poet. He's really good. He's a wordsmith. He can rhyme or rap almost anything. I think it starts out as being fun, but then there were times when he would, he'd tell me he would wake up at three in the morning with something rattling around in his head and he would have to write it before he got back to sleep. And I know that he has spent many nights awake writing poetry. This post is rated R. Sobriety has no factor in it. Though this goal may seem non-viable, the familiar desire is undeniable, a haunting motive to explore, not where no man has ever gone before. I understand that what I seek is not virgin landscape, not unsoiled scenery to rape, but fruit that has been tasted, approved of but not wasted, the ideology of the road, to go, to go, for the sake of going, to know for the sake of knowing, tucked away, hidden in my thoughts, diluted by the overwhelming shots of pungent reality and uncensored morality, but my tongue is swollen from thirst for her next unknowable flavor, of the wonder of the sensuous crack of the soft canyon that runs down her back, the heavy palpation of this traveler's heart who has forgotten to breathe and allowed to restart, in order to continue the trail over flesh, skin, and bone, and take in the wind formed from the mouth to a moan, I long to bask in the beauty and glory, to be content in this contested territory. Nick Fisher. What can I say about Nick Fisher? He's eccentric. <laughs> Decent looking guy. He's got the talk. Enthusiastic. Nick Fisher is a laugh that nobody can ever impersonate. Like, <laughs> deep from the gut laugh. A very kind boy. Very nice, outgoing, friendly young man. And, um, you know, after that, I think he, like, asked me for my phone number. And then he started calling me every night from then on. Like, every single night. It was a little strong, but I was okay with it because I thought he was really cute. Which would not be the case with anyone else. Oh, so that's the guy, because I had a lot of girls um, who were his grade that talked about him all the time, thought he was really rad. And he notices a lot of things that a lot of guys don't, and I think <laughs> maybe it's because he's figured out a way to get girls' attention. I don't know. Nick's a sweet talker, big time. And I've realized it now. Speaks his mind pretty freely. Where do I see him in 20 years? I see him with um, a family, divorced. He's got three kids. He's paying child support and um, is selling kayaks to people at uh, the, I don't know, just at the kayak shop that he owns in Grass Valley. He's happy because he's able to smooth talk every hot chick that comes into his kayak shop so that he could uh, show them the right, uh, the tides to take, you know? And he like finds those things that, those like little things that um, girls wish that other people would notice and they don't. And Nick finds that. It seems maybe plausible that he's figured out a formula. <laughs> If you don't plan on being with them for a long time, you shouldn't tell someone that you will love them forever and that if you could live forever, you want them to be with you <laughs> forever. That's stupid. <laughs> That's really rude. He does something in all the girls that do that he likes or that have liked him or that he's had relationships in to bring out the worst sides in them at some point. Infinities are like Russian dolls, they fit inside of each other. So what did you mean when you proclaimed that you'd love me forever? Was it one to two, or two from ten, or ten ten thousands longer? I thought you were good for a decade, darling, but I couldn't be wrong. 
he'll get really attached, but then something will happen, like they'll cheat on him or something. And that happened enough times where, at this point now, he doesn't want to have anything too deep happen to his heart, because then he'll feel like he just gets heartbroken again. April 2nd, 2009, and so it trickles out. I see clearly now that when you claim to shed immaturity for adulthood, every crimson word from your mouth swarmed with livid falsehood. And while your intentions may not have steered towards malevolence, your actions are a clear declaration of childish emotional violence. However, I refuse to be the one left with a bitter aftertaste on my tongue. The results of your nefarious decisions show that you are intellectually young. While I've been suppressing the feelings of betrayal for my own benefit, you've been trying to scheme your way into seeming to me significant. And while it is not normally my nature to be offensive and crass, you will never again be more than a girl sitting next to me in class. Oh, how I loathe the treacherous snake that I've witnessed you become, trying to set your coils about me, slithering words whispering of whoredom. Though it expresses my anger, this metaphor gives you too much commendation. You are but a child, whoring herself out for affirming acceptance and attention. And though it seems natural that he would eclipse us as the moon does the earth, nothing revolves around you. You are but a deceitful, vain girl without worth. It is utterly ridiculous for me to pensively ponder and dwell. As the saying goes, you don't merit the powder to blow it all to hell. How was I to know that your honey-coated affections concealed your true nature? Of brash depravity, and while he held and fucked you, I hope that you found rapture. And since this is the cruelest thing I can think of to say, and it bears the subscript of cold decisiveness, I will forget you. but then he gets scared so then he'll break it off and be completely opposite of the way he was before he just kind of drunk himself into a stupor every night so that he could sleep now um, I think that's my favorite memory because it's before everything turned shitty and then or before I guess reality set in every action he did after that made me feel worthless. You know, it's like, he knows that he's, he's not yet a man. So he can't make those commitments. So he has to distance himself in order to keep his sanity <laughs> and to keep growing. And I completely agree with that. I think I would want to tell Nick Fisher that deep down, You were good enough, even if you never thought you were. Yeah. Is you can't put Nick in a nutshell. I think Nick is a very wonderful person waiting to happen. He is an artistic bud waiting to blossom. I think people who know him 10 and 15, 50 years from now are going to be so enriched by knowing him. Um, I think he's a very nice person with some growing to do, but I really enjoyed the time I spent with him. He doesn't use pencil. Doesn't fancy paint There's but one material That he'll interpretation that Rachel has made of me. It's, it's very interesting. <laughs>
but I was not aware that my ex-girlfriends would see this documentary. <laughs> <laughs> my ex-girlfriends and I are not in general speaking terms. <laughs> so I can't really debate the validity of this film. All I can say is, this is what people think of me. Uh, I'm not really given a, an opportunity for a rebuttal. I do like the film. I mean, there were a lot of comments that I didn't know so right. There were a few accusations that I'm a social butterfly of sorts. That I'm very extroverted. I don't feel this way. This movie does show a darker side of me. I don't know if I'm as dark as people portrayed me, especially Rachel's readings. I do need my time to reflect and just be myself, to be alone. And it's very important to me. I am, there are a lot of thoughts that are shared on my blog, but there are a lot more that are not present on the internet. I guess that affects the question of what you can really know about somebody from such a social network insights and stuff. I'm very honored that a documentary was made about me. It's something I never expected happened to happen. Um, closing thoughts. This film's gonna be fucking awesome. Make your interpretation on what you've seen. If you want to know more, um, Rachel has very graciously included my phone number. It takes more than social networking sites to know somebody, I guess. Everybody has an interpretation of the people they know, and it's based on the experiences they have with them. And it's interesting to build a perception of somebody off of what you hear, off of what you read about them. No, I don't know if I'll change anything. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, you just gotta meet him. He's a cool guy. Talks to you about a lot of cool things. Uh, yeah, he's fun to hang out with. <laughs>